All right. Last week, we were about halfway through our questions for lesson, I believe this is lesson 12 uh, on homosexuality. Lesson 13, yes, is on dancing. So uh, number 12, how does homosexuality violate God's standard of purity? That's where we kind of ended up last week uh, discussing that. We talked about the fact that the commandment of God is that we are to uh, have control over ourselves. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, he describes the fact that he disciplines his body so that even after he's preached to others, he himself isn't disqualified from the race that he refers to in verse 25. And the importance of that being that no matter how many people we help teach, no matter how many people who may be baptized, partly because of, of our efforts in helping them to learn the knowledge of the truth, it doesn't matter how many uh, people we help turn from a life of sin to a life of doing what God wants, if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, it, it, at least for us, for our soul, it doesn't profit anything, doesn't do anything. We have to make sure we're doing what's right. And of course, there's the component as well of of making sure we're, we're actually accurately telling people how to get to heaven. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the blind leading the blind type of scenario. If we're not doing what's right, how can we properly teach others? Uh, but the self-control, the idea of purity, be holy, as, for he is holy just as God is holy, the Father. We're to have that same characteristic as his children. Number 13, how does modern culture blur the distinction between the sexes? Okay, you know, I, I think you can look at this from two different perspectives. From definition, especially today, just the definition of the sexes is completely, not, I wouldn't even say blurred, it's almost non-existent now, especially with the advent of, uh, or I said advent, but the, it's, it's not new, but non-binary, not, not male or female. And, and so it, there's not even the definition of sexes really in a, in a definition form. Oh yeah, they turned it upside down, okay. And then what about the, the roles as well? Okay, in an effort for uh, what, what people refer to as equality, uh, they kind of not only usurped the roles of what men and women are supposed to be in the Bible, or as God tells us in the Bible, but, but flip-flopped them, okay, as if, as if sameness equals equality or equality equals sameness. And that's, that's not true. Okay. People can be equal even though they're not the same and maybe don't have the same roles or the same jobs or whatever the case may be. It doesn't mean they're not equal. It just means they have different roles that they fill, different jobs they perform, different tasks that they're given. And so sameness, which is ultimately equity, versus equality, that's kind of a big deal in our society right now. The people, people are, are, are uh, kind of substituting one for the other and pretending it's the same thing when it's not. Uh, but modern culture blurs the distinction between the sexes through definition of those sexes or throwing out that definition of the sexes and, and through the roles and the, 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 the viewpoint even. I mean, if you're, a, if you're in any way uh, whether it's stay-at-home mom or a traditional role of uh, the, the husband or, or any of that, in many ways our society kind of looks at you as old-fashioned, kind of looks at you as, as being of, a, of an older generation that really needs to just go away. And unfortunately, huh? Shame. Absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're shamed or attempted. People attempt to shame you. Ultimately, it only, it's only successful if we feel shame for it. Uh, but ultimately, the, they attempt to shame us because of, of our holding. Ultimately, and it's not, it's not about traditional values, okay, or, or the values of the 40s and 50s and, and so forth that people, you know, sometimes that's what they, oh, you're, you're like a 50 years out of date. It's godly values that we need to hold to. Okay, sometimes traditions change, and that's okay. It's okay for traditions to change. It's okay for, for culture to adapt to a, a changing time as long as it's still in adherence to what God says regarding the roles of men as fathers and husbands, of women as wives and mothers. It, that's the, the values that we have to uphold. And unfortunately, the, the, the two become 
meshed together. And part of that is because some of those values that were held 50, 60 years ago are biblical values. And so the, the attempt to shame anyone who has those traditional family values or the, the, what we might refer to as the, uh, the traditional family home or family unit, uh, that's, that's shamed in a lot of ways. Yes, ma'am. And, and why, you know. or whatever it is, and one of those you inherit from your dad. Right. You know, and so there's facts, and there's, oh, I can say I'm a millionaire, now we all know I'm not, <laughs> you know, but just because I say it, does that make it true? So you can walk around saying... It's your truth, though, Stu. <laughs> that doesn't make it a, a truth, truth. You yeah. know what I'm Yeah. Yeah. Or did. Or did. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. And I feel bad for our kids coming up. I know. You know, it is so. Well, there was a. Uh, I'm going to do a daily devotional on it at some point, but there was an article about a British teacher in the UK uh, and this conversation she had with a couple of her students, and her students were arguing with her. She was trying to say that it's wrong to condemn anybody if they identify as like a cat, like in this case it was a cat. It's wrong to, to say that, 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 that you can't do that. And they're like, this is reality. Well, why are you trying to tell us that just because I say I'm something that that therefore makes it so? That, <laughs> there's a difference, there's a huge disconnect between reality and what people want to be reality. Fantasy is what it is. Their own laws, for sure. Yeah, anarchy. It's a, it's kind of a yeah a, a yeah <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah. Ending us to number thirteen. Number fourteen. What are the characteristics of true masculinity? And and, and keep in mind that there there is a, there is a little bit of a difference between what culture defines as masculine versus what God defines as masculine. You know, uh, Mark brings up, you know, having a, a strong handshake. Well, that's, that's a cultural concept of, of masculine, okay? Just because a young man doesn't have a strong handshake doesn't mean he's not masculine, okay? That's not what that necessarily means. But as the New Testament or the Bible describes masculinity, what are the characteristics of true masculinity? I saw a hand somewhere. Yes, ma'am. Okay. They tend to be bigger than the female species. Um, if you're talking about person, their voices tend to be deeper. Not always, but tend to be. Okay. You know, um, a man is is built uh, more to fight, so you would think he would protect those around him. Um, and uh, I mean, you can get into chivalry and all of that, but if right. it's looking on the outside. Right, and and, and there's a difference between physical attributes of masculinity versus femininity and acquired attributes, I guess you could say, or taught attributes. You know, so you've got the, the physical components of it that should, not always, you know, but you know, some, some men aren't built traditionally as, you know, you typically associate men and women the same way sometimes. Okay, that's not necessarily wrong, you know, if they're, you know, that's the way they were uh, their genetics are, and that's how they're born, you know, that's fine. That doesn't mean anything. But in terms of how they present themselves, okay, how they, the, the type of characteristics that they have adopted, not just were, were born with, but adopted characteristics. And I think that's a lot of what these questions are about, too. You know, we talk about true masculinity as boys are being taught by godly fathers and godly grandfathers or godly uncles, the, the types of characteristics they should 
embody, the type of, of character that they should manifest in their lives. What type of, of New Testament, that's what I would consider, or, or Bible, say biblical, true masculinity, that's what I would consider that. What, what type of, of characteristics should we be teaching our young men? Uh, okay, to, to, to lead, yeah. Okay, sorry. To provide, okay. To have a sense of honor. All right. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot in the in the Bible that describes a sense of, of honor that God gives us regarding right and wrong. Okay. And if I'm doing something that is wrong or is not what God expects of me, it's dishonorable. Versus honorable is fulfilling those roles that God has called for me to fulfill. Uh, and certainly, our world has a different def- different definition or different application of the concept of honor. But, uh, yeah, all of these characteristics of, of uh, raising our young men to make sure they understand what their roles are, not to use those roles to, to attempt to lord over or think that you're better than anyone else, okay, especially in the sense of a husband and wife relationship or in the church, uh, but to use, as God has, has taught these young men to do, to grow into that role of being leaders. And, and we've mentioned this before, but... We really, as parents and as grandparents, we really need to be reminding our young fellows that their goal one day should be to be qualified to be an elder. Whether or not they end up wanting to desire or desire that office at that point, that's neither here nor there when we're trying to raise our young sons to at least be qualified to be an elder. And I don't think that gets discussed nearly as much as it should in the church, you know, we have such a dearth of men who are qualified to be elders because a lot of times it doesn't really get start, started to be talked about or, or even considered until men are in their 30s and 40s. And by that time, sometimes it's too late for, for a, a fellow to, to put his life in a situation where he can be qualified. And so, you know, I, I heard a lot growing up about preachers. You know, men, we need more preachers, we need more preachers. And sure, I, I, you know, we can always, we always need more people willing to preach. Okay, that's certainly true. But l- preachers, while they certainly can be leaders and should uh, ha- carry those qual- qualities and characteristics, leaders under God's definition of the authority of the church are elders. Uh, and we should be reminding our young men to take on those attributes to find in First Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, uh, to, to grow into that role, to at least be able to be qualified at that point, uh, and, and to make that a goal. And if they embody those characteristics that are, are shown there, that, will, that goes a long way towards the concept of true masculinity as the Bible defines it. Yes, ma'am? To be humble and have an attitude of service. Yes, be humble. Not only uh, being humble with brethren, being humble with those who are outside, but being humble with your family. You know, there's, it, it's okay to, as a leader of a family, to show that, that you are also sensitive, to show that you have emotions. You know, and again, that kind of goes back to a cultural difference as well, that 50, 60 years ago, boys were being raised not to show emotion, or at least by and large. It was kind of, you know, boys, men, you're not supposed to kind of show emotion. You're supposed to be leaders. Well, you can be a leader and still show those qualities and characteristics. You can be humble with, and you should be humble with your family, but also show that, that softer side, show that, that sensitive side and, and vulnerable side. And I think that's very important for our boys to, to be taught as well. What else? Anything else? I, saw, I thought I saw it in there. Attitude yeah, attitude of service, that's right. Yeah, being, and again, not only service to my brethren and service to my neighbor, but service to my wife, service to my children, service to my grandparents, service to, you know, being one to serve, not the one to be served. You know, just because you're the quote-unquote leader of the house doesn't mean that therefore everybody serves you. Jesus was the master, and yet what did he show by his actions? Yeah, he, he said, I, I did not come to be served, but to serve. Okay, if, and in the example of, of Jesus washing the feet of the apostles, if I, your master, do this to you, so you should do to one another. Well, no one is in such a position or leadership role that service is beneath them. And, and husbands, especially, and, and Christian husbands need to be very careful about that. 
but we don't take that role beyond what the New Testament describes it. What about characteristics of true femininity? Because the way our culture views or, or perceives Christian women, they're weak, okay? They, they're indecisive, they don't have opinions, they're just kind of there. They're often portrayed that way, Christian women are. But what does the New Testament or in the Bible describe with regard to true femininity? And how, how should we, what characteristics should we be raising our, our girls to embody and to, to manifest? Okay. Right, right. That, yeah, that term quiet, uh, 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 quiet spirit in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, I believe it is, where Peter discusses the, uh, the, like the spirit of, of Sarah and whose daughters you are, if you have those same characteristics that she has, that gentle and quiet spirit uh, that is being referred to there, it doesn't mean silent in that context. It means uh, to have one that is, is uh, how did, how did uh, Vines had a really interesting take on that. It was a quiet confidence, uh, quiet, quiet confidence in the sense that she doesn't have to prove anything. Okay? She is dedicated to what her role is, dedicated and committed to what God has called on her to be, and she is content in that. And I think that that's a, a, an important aspect to that, is that co uh, contentment in our roles, both as men and as women, as God has called us to be, whatever role that may be, given whatever state of life we're in, to be content in those roles uh, and to do them to the best of our ability. Uh, certainly true femininity uh, also includes shamefastness, Okay, recognizing the, the concept of modesty, both physical modesty and uh, spiritual modesty. Okay, there's a shamefastness that Paul describes in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, there is the, uh, the need certainly to embody the word of God, just as Peter you know, it describes about this, this Christian woman whose husband may not be a Christian, uh, to be able to embody the word in such a way to have an example that, it, that teaches your example speaks. Not, you know, not to say that, she, that the woman can't speak and, and to talk to her husband about the Bible. That's not what Peter's saying. But that her example follows it up. It, it, it sets the, the standard and carries that weight with it that when the, the wife may say something about the Bible, say something about Jesus, that it's shown in her life. It's something the husband has been observing. Uh, First Timothy chapter... Or is it Titus? It's Titus chapter 2, is it? Where uh, Paul describes the roles of the older men, the younger men, the older women, or the, the older men, the older women, the younger women, and then the young men. Yeah, Titus. It's Titus chapter 2 or 3. Is it 3? 2? Uh, okay. 2. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Titus chapter 2. Uh, and, and so those roles that are being described, how that those older men, the type of example they're to set, being honorable, being uh, respectful, having a good reputation, certainly that carries with it into, into elders as well. Uh, but then the, the older women, how that they're to help teach the younger women. Of course, that requires the younger women to be willing to receive advice. Okay, Certainly as older women, we have to be careful how we convey that advice. Uh, but younger women, not to be so proud that we just say, I'm going to do it my way and I don't care, you know, what that, that older lady wants, you know, wants me to do or says or, or suggests or whatever. And then the younger men as well having the characteristics there to have. But, but having that femininity is being, being content in the role that God has given. And that includes being a mother and, and being that... Uh, if the man is often seen, and in the Bible, certainly, the, the man is, is, tends to be the provider. Of course, the virtuous woman was very active as well. Okay, so don't, don't discount the fact that sometimes mothers and wives could also be involved in the economic aspect, if you want to call it that, or the providing for. But if men are the physical providers and physical protectors, in a lot of ways, mothers tend to be the emotional providers and the emotional protectors, especially as it pertained to children, given that the husbands were oftentimes, the fathers were oftentimes out at work during the day, and the mothers would help take care of that. 
Uh, and so, yeah, I know our society views that as totally old-fashioned, that is a totally uh, inappropriate type of, of stereotyping and things like that. But these are the qualities. It doesn't mean a woman has to stay home 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's not, that's not, even though our society seems to think that that's what Christians think and believe, that's not what the Bible says. The virtuous woman was very, very active. But it does show that uh, these roles are to be respected. And, you know, to, to a certain extent, and I've known of brethren, known of Christians who uh, the husband, his, his job sometimes was maybe IT work. The wife had a job outside the home. And yet they made it work and they still, it, it's very hard in that type of situation to preserve the roles of the, the mother and the father and so forth when the mother's the one kind of going outside the home to work. And yet they made it work. They still observed and, and the wife, for instance, still observed the role of the husband as the leader of the home. And, and there was still that recognition of those roles as God has given them, even though their financial situation was such that it was a little bit of a different, uh, and today I guess it's probably more, far more common, but even though it was a little bit different than the traditional type that we think about, and yet they were still able to ab uphold the characteristics of what a husband and father, mother and, and wife should be. Anything through verse 14 and 15? Word, yeah. Not a slave. Right. Well, and, and, and there's a key component there, you know, when, when Peter talks about uh, the Sarah and, and calling Abraham Lord, there's a key component there where Sarah, she chose to do that. Abraham didn't have to make her call him Lord. No husband, should, it, no husband is ever called on to force his wife to be submissive because that's not the definition of submissive. Submissive is the wife places herself in submission. This is why Peter calls, then calls on the husbands to bear with them, to be understanding with them as the weaker vessel. A lot of Christians have, have, have kind of uh, interpreted that concept of weaker vessel. Well, she's physically kind of the, the weaker one. I don't believe that's at all what Peter's describing there. It's the fact that God has put you in a position of authority. You're not to abuse that position because the wife, in her seeking to obey the husband or to obey God, therefore obeys the husband. She places herself, un she's vulnerable and chooses to be vulnerable to you. Therefore, acknowledge that. Don't don't use that to lord over her. And certainly, the the component there of of nowhere in the New Testament do we find husbands being called on to to put their women in submission. I don't find that. It's, it's the women being called on to be submissive and husbands to be mindful of that. Anything else with that? Number 16, explain how homosexuality is debasing. Now, what does the term debasing mean? It's, it, it's dishonorable. Okay, it's not just... Sometimes debasing, it, depending on the context, can mean it's, it's uh, uh, like it's, it's debased in the sense of immoral. This is describing dishonorable. And this is what, in fact, in the lesson, Romans chapter 1, Mark mentions Romans 1, those things that are dishonorable. They gave themselves over to these things that men with men, women with women, these things that were dishonorable. Because God calls it dishonorable. Well, it, takes away from his it does. It takes away from his plan. Right. It, it is contrary to nature. That doesn't make it, it doesn't mean that adultery isn't sinful, even though it's, quote unquote, natural in the sense of, of man and a woman. The concept here is it's contrary to what God has established. And, and in particular, Romans 1 is describing that, that natural uh, uh, established relationship that God placed between a husband and a wife or a man and a woman. And that's why it's dishonorable. Now, you know, people can argue all they want. Love is love. Well, God gives them, God gives people the right to choose. You could choose whatever you want to do. Okay. 
He also provides the consequences if you choose to do that which is dishonorable. And even in Romans 1, there at the end of Romans 1, Paul says that those who do such things are deserving of death. Those who approve of such things are deserving of death. And they, know, they knew that. The Gentiles knew that when they set up their own gods to kind of give themselves a, free, a blank check to do what they want. But God allowed them to do that. Okay, it doesn't mean God approves of it, and it doesn't mean we should approve of it. But certainly, hey, you want to do this, that's your choice. But there are consequences to that action. Right. You're exchanging. Yeah. 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 Anything else through number 16? Number 17. Is homosexuality genetically predetermined or is it a lifestyle choice? Now, with this one, obviously, Mark, he's of the persuasion it's a lifestyle choice. And it is a lifestyle choice. Make no, make no mistake. Whether or not there is any kind of genetic predisposition, I'm, I'm not even going to argue that because it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm perfectly willing to grant that maybe there is some kind of, even though they haven't quite pinned that down yet, maybe there is some kind of genetic predisposition like there is to alcoholism or addiction and things like that. Okay, but it doesn't change anything. Just as, as a man may be predisposed to heterosexuality, if he's not married, what does he have to discipline himself with or against? Fornication. A man who is married, what does he have to guard himself against? Lust of adultery. Okay? So it takes the same, same self-control is there that regardless of what the situation is, whether you're guarding yourself against the temptation of homosexuality or you're guarding yourself against temptation of fornication or adultery, it's all the same in the sense of submitting to God's will and making sure that you are abiding to what he says. And so I'm, I'm not even going to argue with people who want to say, well, it's, it's genetic. They were born that way. I don't care. It doesn't make any. I was born this way. And it doesn't mean that it's okay for me to live the way I want. So what difference does it make? It doesn't. It doesn't make any difference. Anything through number 17? Yes, sir. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Joe. Yeah. If you're predetermined, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. In Corinthians, those people who had been that stopped doing it. Yeah. That means they quit doing it. It was a choice. That's right. That's right. And that's a good point. All, all sin is a choice, regardless. And, and you're right. If, if, if you take predetermination to be, this is what you're going to be. And you have no choice. You have no option. That's a big difference. And you're absolutely right. And yet... The Corinthians and such were some of you, 1 Corinthians 6. Some of them were what? Well, what's listed in that list of, of sins that will not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians 6? Homosexuals. Okay, there's effeminate and homosexuals, or the King James has abusers of themselves with mankind. Uh, the term homosexual, that uh, arson coitus, it's arson meaning male, coitus meaning sex. It's, it's that... that that male sexual relationship, male with male, that's being described there. And that is what some of such were some of, some of you. I can imagine somebody arguing, well, they just weren't born that way. Okay, they, they just did it because they, they wanted to. They weren't born that way. So you can't condemn people who are born that way. And that goes back to Joe's point. Well, you still have to control yourself. You know, it, it does, it, it, and, and that goes to the point of these individuals, how can you say they weren't born that way. How do you know that? In the end, they were once that way, and now they were no longer. You have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been justified. They have changed their behavior. Go ahead, Joe. And further, that's a charge against God. It says that God has made man upright. That same God made them where they can't help but sin. That's, and that's a great point. God is that. That's right. That's a great point. God is never going to create a human being that must sin. Uh, in the sense of, of they have no choice. God's never going to create a human being that way. And, and, and so, and again, and that, that still goes to, to, to you know, I, I kind of rephrase genetic predisposition. I still choose. I still make a decision. I still make a choice. 
and, and whether it's drinking alcohol or, or doing drugs or committing homosexuality, it's a choice. It's a determination that I have made. And if God says one thing and I choose something else, I am literally against God. Okay, I am doing that which is, is uh, contrary to what God told me to do. Number 18. Uh, Snoop, did you, were, were you going to say something? That's right. Is judgment That's right. And regardless of how you were predisposed or predetermined or whatever it is, every single one of us is given the charge of having self-control. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the concept of judgment is, deserves its own entire quarter of, a class, of classes to discuss. The world's concept of judging Judge not lest thou be, I can't tell you how many times, and we all have heard it quoted by people, oh, you can't tell me I'm doing something wrong because Jesus says you're not supposed to do that. Well, there's a lot of different, there's actually several different terms in the New Testament for, for judge or judgment or judging. Okay, I can't pass judgment on anyone's soul. That's, that's Jesus' role. That is his only. However, Jesus also says to judge according to righteous judgment. That means to determine right and wrong. Now, can I determine right and wrong using God's word? Sure. Can I share with someone, and should I share with someone, what God's word says about right and wrong, especially if, if their soul's in danger because they're doing something contrary to God's word? Sure. Just as Snoop pointed out, that's not me, that's not, that's not me saying that. It's God's word saying that. Oh, well, that's your interpretation. Again, that goes back to, well, here, here's the scriptures. You read it. Okay. In fact, I think I've mentioned before, my brother, he had an a acquaintance at college who was, she was a lesbian, and he wasn't really saying anything to her at all. Just on Facebook, he just quoted 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. And he didn't offer any commentary, didn't offer any application. I mean, it's, it's pretty self-applicative. But this, this girl got very upset, and Donnie pointed out, I didn't say, I didn't say anything. I literally just quoted scripture, and yet she was upset because of what that scripture said. And ultimately, and that goes back to being mad at the messenger when really in reality, they're mad at the message. And of course, my response has always been, take it up with God. You, you think it'll get you anywhere, you take that up with God and see what happens. Uh, certainly, many will at judgment, unfortunately. But in the end, if I'm just quoting scripture... You know, they can, they can claim mis, misapplication. Oh, you're not, that's, that's out of context. <laughs> First Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 is very, very clear within its context. All right, anything else to number 17? Number 18, discuss the similarity between homosexuality and drug addiction. Okay, it's a choice. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and within the context of the lesson uh, that Mark uh, provided, his discussion of that similarity goes back to you, you have a little bit, then a little bit more, then a little bit more to the point where to fulfill that uh, perceived uh, need or to get that same feeling or whatever, you have to do more and more and more and more. And it's the sense of, of uh, the, the component that Mark brings out there has to do with that having a heart that is focused on something so much so that, that they claim they can stop anytime they want to, right? But ultimately they can't. They're slaves to that desire. And having a heart that is full of that desire, it, Mark pointed out a heart full of lust in the case of homosexuality. When our heart is supposed to be committed to 
to God, to the things that are honorable and holy and, and, and the list of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, whatsoever things are pure and holy and, and of good report, things like that. We're to be meditating on those things. But if we're meditating or, or, or obsessed with alcohol or if, if all we're thinking about is the next time I, I you know, get to drink or whatever, or in the case of homosexuality, if that's what all I'm focused on, all I'm thinking about, and even beyond that, Okay, whether we're talking about pornography or adultery or, homo or uh, heterosexuality, which fornication uh, within that, any of that is the same concept. Okay, if our focus, if our, what we're committed to is that which is fleshly, that which is of this world, it's in direct contradiction to, to God. That's what Paul's point in Romans 8 is all about. The carnal mind, the fleshly mind, the mind that is only focused on the desires of the flesh, it cannot please God. And that's why Paul kind of contrasts the mind of the spirit versus the mind of the flesh. And if you're led by the spirit, you'll put to, de put to death the deeds of the body. Anything else through number 18? Number 19, provide examples of modern society's continued moral de degeneration. I I'm not going to go into detail with this one. Obviously, they abound, especially, you know, in the last. Uh, and, it, and it's interesting to me, you know, there's a lot of uh, articles, like I said, on things like this. And, and a lot of this stuff has been around, actually, for quite some time. You know, transgenderism has actually been around for, well, I mean, it's been around forever. But in terms of our society and, and uh, aspects of our society regarding whether it's laws or, or uh, uh, societal um, mores, things like that, you know, 20, 25 years or so, it's, it's kind of been there. Even though it hasn't been in the forefront, it's still been there. Uh, homosexuality a little bit longer okay going back to you know really the the late 80s is when really homosexuality kind of came into the forefront but it's always been around the fact of the matter is some of these things tend to to kind of come up all at once and really at least in my mind the the big jump up into the societal society's eyes I guess or society's awareness has really been in the last five years or so you know, really around, you know, from 2016, 17 to 2020 or so, that's really when a lot of this stuff kind of just jumped up. Not that it just all of a sudden came into existence. It just kind of came to everybody's awareness more. And that's when people started kind of looking a little bit deeper and seeing it almost everywhere. Even though before maybe it just wasn't as obvious. It wasn't as apparent. And I think the, the modern society's continued moral degeneration. I, I'm always careful with that term moral. We're going to use more. We're going to use God's morals. Okay, God's morals versus man's morals or society's morals are two completely different things. But in terms of continued moral, God's the originator of morality. God's morality, moral definition, the degeneration from that is everywhere. It's in media. It's in social media. It's in uh, TV shows, movies. It's in books all over the place. It's in school. It's at Walmart. It's everywhere. Which just goes to show how careful we have to be, not only for ourselves, but also as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, whatever we are, uh, to, to make sure our young people know to be aware of these dangers. Okay? Don't, don't allow it to become normalized to them. Because, I mean, Savannah, William, they all, they all know people at school who are homosexual, you know, and, and, and they've asked me, how do I handle this person who is a lesbian or, you know, whatever? And so we have that discussion. We talk about that. Uh, and it's, it's important, I, you know, my, my, point, my point, for instance, to Savannah was, listen, there's nothing wrong with talking to this person. You need to be, okay? Maybe invite her to church, whatever, you know. You can't act as if it's okay, what she's doing any more than maybe friends you know who are committing fornication. You can't act like that's okay either. But they still need to have a friend who can be a godly example or at least have somebody they can talk to about the Bible maybe. And so to have that avenue to be able to ask godly questions, ask about the Bible, invite them to church, that sort of thing. All right, anything through number 19? Number 20, 
What hope is extended to homosexuals? On what basis can sinners obtain forgiveness? Well, first of all, what hope is extended to homosexuals? Forget, what Joe pointed out a minute ago, 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you. Okay, this, this is a group of people, Corinthians, and the Corinthians weren't the only ones, but this is a group of people among whom they were off in all kinds of degenerate ways. Okay, all kinds of sinful conduct that they were, had committed themselves to. But then they were taught the gospel, they were pricked in their heart, just like the Jews on the day of Pentecost, and they were willing to change. They were willing to repent and submit to God's will. That's the hope that is extended to all people, whether it's homosexuality, adultery, fornication, uh, I mean, all kinds of, of sexual sins, but also lying, stealing, uh, whatever it may be. It, that's the hope extended, is that the power of God's word is able to transform an individual's heart. Uh, that's what the power of God's word can do. On what basis can sinners obtain forgiveness? Yep. Repentance, uh, obviously, the only, the only way a person's going to repent, be willing to change and turn away, is if they have heard what God's Word says, they believe what God's Word says. Therefore, they submit themselves to God's Word. They repent, they confess that Jesus is Christ, Son of God, and are baptized. Have sins washed away. All right, anything else through number 20? All right. That's the end of lesson 12. Um, the second bell is about to ring. So we'll, do, we'll, we'll start lesson 13 next Sunday on dancing. Uh, it's, a, it's a shorter lesson, so uh, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's a little bit here that I do want to, to focus on, but uh, we'll, we'll probably get through that hopefully in a more timely manner than this last one. This last one certainly not only was it talking about homosexuality, but for our purposes it applied to transgender and that sort of thing. And that's... That's, that's really at the forefront of, of, of kind of society right now. So I think it was worth spending a little bit more time on Lesson 12, but I, I think we'll be able to, to move fairly, fairly quickly through some of these other lessons. Thank you, everybody.